maybe this isn't simple for a lot of people, but maybe this will help a bookkeeper that doesn't charge for a diagnostic understand, even if you're just going to charge a hundred dollars for a diagnostic, it creates that financial transaction where they realize this is not for free. Like it sets a precedent that the work you do is valuable. And if they're not willing to pay a measly hundred dollars to have someone diagnose the state of their books, how do you think it's going to go when you try to present them a $7,000 proposal? (laughs) (laughs) Right? (laughs) Yes. So it weeds out people and that scares other people too. Right. And I do the same thing with my discovery calls. If someone comes to me cold and tries to book a discovery call, they're charged for it. Hey, and welcome to the Ambitious Bookkeeper podcast. I am Serena Shoup. I am a CPA and mom of three, and I'm running a virtual bookkeeping business mostly from my home. You're in the right place if you're a bookkeeper, accountant, or an accounting student, and you know that your purpose is bigger than sitting in a cubicle. If you're ready to learn some actionable tips and strategies to help you start and grow a bookkeeping or accounting business, I hope you stick around. For the last two months, if you've been following along on the podcast, you may have been listening to our special niche series where I interviewed many accounting firm owners who specialize and niche in a certain industry or a certain software, and hopefully you gained a ton of value and took away lots of ideas that you can implement in your own bookkeeping or accounting business. This month, we are doing a series on systems. Again, I will be interviewing experts on systems as they pertain to bookkeeping and accounting. I hope you enjoy. If you've been enjoying these special series, please take a screenshot, share them on the socials, tag me at Ambitious Bookkeeper, and let me know what has been your biggest takeaway. Another great way to support this is to go ahead and review our podcast and drop a question in there for me because I have something special dropping as well around little Q&As. So if you have a question you'd like answered, please send me a DM and I will record a short and sweet podcast episode and maybe you'll hear it on the air. Thank you so much for supporting the show. I truly appreciate you tuning in each week and as does my team. We put a lot of effort into producing these shows and I hope that you are finding tons of value, inspiration, and learning a thing or two. All right, now let's get into today's episode. Welcome back to the Ambitious Bookkeeper podcast. As part of our systems series this month, I have a special guest, John Ray from Scrutinize on the podcast. Hello, John. How are you? Hi, Serena. I'm doing good. It's finally starting to cool off here in Austin, so getting better every day. Yeah, awesome. So we met at, well, I guess the only time I've met you in person was at ZeroCon in New Orleans. Right, Um, yeah. We were introduced. Like a year ago. Yeah, more than a year Ish. ago. Or yeah, about about a year ago. All right. And I was introduced to you by the girl I roomed with. <laughs> yeah. So that was pretty cool. And obviously, like I, like you, have a passion for making the bookkeeping industry better as a whole. So can you explain to our listener exactly what Scrutinize is and kind of how you got into creating this software and company? Sure. Yep. So Scrutinize is an automated bookkeeping file review tool. And you could think about file reviews in an infinite number of contexts, but we sort of think about it in three buckets. There's the, I've just inherited a set of books from somebody else, either another bookkeeping firm or, you know, my client who is DIY. And I need to go about kind of systematically getting my hands around the state of the union, so to speak, of these books and figure out okay, what's potentially wrong? What kind of scale of activity is going on? Uh, and use that to inform my you know, pricing and scoping process and that proposal process. The second category is that recurring kind of monthly review that you do. Do we do the things? Do we do them correctly, right? How do we keep things ticked and tied as we walk things forward? And then the third sort of major category of review is just a regular recurring quality review. So something you might do with your team uh, once a quarter, two times, one time a year, just looking back on, you know, a client's file for the entire year and saying, okay, are there any patterns we could see here that, that we should surface that may be related to, you know, training gaps or process breakdowns. So awesome. that's kind of what Scrutinize is. Happy to also tell you how I came about. Yeah. Let's, know, let's go there. <laughs> yeah. 
So I traditionally really am like a finance person. That was like my background in school. When I got out of school, I was like, I'm going to go, you know, do corporate finance. Didn't really want to go to the banking route. So actually ended up working for a sort of investment holding company. And this holding company would invest in a bunch of different types of businesses. And I joined as the accounting manager at that sort of holding company level. And that was great because it gave me a bunch of different looks at a bunch of different types of businesses early on. Fast forward about a year in, we run into a situation where we find that this lady had stolen like $200,000. And it turns out that, you know, after a bunch of forensic accounting and stuff like that, there was something in my head that was like, how did we not find this? Like, why is there not a system that was like, you know, in place where we could like manage and track and set up, you know, these searches for these different patterns that, you know, eventually were uncovered as, as being fraudulent. And so that's like, that got parked fast forward to, I started my own firm in 2018. And as we started to add the bookkeeping service segment to our fractional CFO offering, we kind of ran into this recurring problem, both at the front end of engagements, like I mentioned, getting our hands around the state of the union, and then also making sure that our people were doing what we were supposed to do and getting everything done correctly month to month. And so then it was kind of this aha moment where I was like, okay, (laughs) this past experience plus this you know, current experience, how do we kind of get our hands around, you know, building a system internally that we can use to check for all these different conditions. And then after building that internal tool and talking with other bookkeepers, it turns out that this is like a common sort of challenge a lot of people face. So we decided to kind of spin that internal tool out. And that is what is now called Scrutinize. Awesome. Yeah, there's definitely a need for this. (laughs) So If someone's listening in on like this and kind of interested in looking at the tool, what bookkeeping softwares, accounting softwares do you guys integrate with? Yep. So we directly integrate with QBO and Xero. And then we also have a, an Excel file upload tool where you can export certain collections of reports from uh, QuickBooks desktop or QuickBooks online and upload them in Excel format and we'll adjust it and give you, you know, a similar level of analysis. Interesting. All right. Very cool. What are your thoughts on if someone is interested in implementing a tool like this, like where should they be in their business, quote unquote? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, When are they ready for something like this and whatnot? It definitely depends on the primary use case that's bringing you to feeling like you have a need. I I tend to feel like for the scoping and proposal use case, that's pretty much widespread. Like if you're, you know, one person shop or a 400 person shop, you need some kind of rigor around that process of getting your finger on the pulse of the books that you're inheriting and using that to inform capacity, pricing, right? Scope and scale of the engagement. For the recurring reviews, a lot of times that generally, you know, from what we see happens when you get to more than about five people on the team, Mm -hmm. under five people, it's generally kind of a high trust environment. People tend to have a high level of confidence in their own work, you know, Mm -hmm. and in a small group, it's easy to kind of spot check things. So some of it's, you know, the size and then some of it's just client complexity. So if you're running into clients that have, you know, thousands of thousands of transactions every month, even if it's just you doing the books, you sort of get to the scale in, in, a, in a transaction volume or from a complexity viewpoint where one person reviewing all of that is just not tenable, right? It's not, yeah. you're, it's not that you've made mistakes. And that's the other thing I like to say too. It's, it's not always you. Like, you know, we're not selling this so that you could find your mistakes or your team's mistakes. It's like, we live in a world where you've got integrations with 10 other systems that are hitting this set of books and you've got other people and and you know sources of truth that are piped in through bank feeds and things like that so it's not always necessarily checking for like did you do something wrong it's like right. is is this environment set up correctly yeah uh, and that's kind of really anybody could use that yeah absolutely i like i'm glad i asked that question because it's it is true in a very small team environment and a small client base, people have time to do, you know, spot checks and, and reviews and stuff. But as the team grows and as you, the owner, assuming the listener is the person who owns the bookkeeping business, you begin to become out of touch with 
the day-to-day of each of your clients and you still need to make sure that you have a process in place to ensure accuracy and that things are caught and and all that good stuff. Can we talk about exactly how the proposal scoping thing works? So you just connect it to a QuickBooks or a zero when you are doing like a diagnostic before you sign on a client? Is that how generally the workflow goes? So exactly that. That's the that's okay. the front end is you get on a scrutinize, you get whatever level of access that you need to that ledger system to pull the data in. Or if they, sometimes people are like touchy because they're like, I don't want to let my current bookkeeper know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's where the file upload tool comes in. You can just say like, well, just run these files and send them to uh-huh. me and I'll get you a quote. Uh-huh. But uh, the the kind of process is is broken up into three main segments. And the first is what we call assess. And assess is all about, okay, what, you know, in, in general is the state of these books. And so we're looking at things like transaction volume, reconciliation status across different accounts, historical transaction volume, but then also the different types of transactions by count, line amount, things like that. And the way we like to think about that step is that Everybody's got their own different pricing methodology. Some people are, you know, they go on transaction volume. Some people price based off of, you know, percentage of revenue or percentage of expenses. So whatever that end state is for how you're going to go about getting a number that you're going to send in your proposal is sort of separate from this understanding of what's our actual cost to service, right? Because regardless of what the client's going to pay us, we need to know what it's going to cost to service this this client, and then hopefully charge more than that, right? Mm -hmm. So this data that we give you in the assess step, which is this first step, is really all about how you could triangulate the different types of activity that you're going to inherit and have to do and maintain so that you could start building up and say, okay, there's 50 invoices a month with two line items each. That's going to take me, you know, on average, like two minutes each invoice to put in. And you could kind of go through and start to build up your you know, estimated hourly time to to service this client and then back into the math, whatever your cost structure is there. And so that's like the, I would say the meat and potatoes. And then the second and third step are really about kind of just other things that we might want to identify as potentially wrong or just potential for cleanup. So the second mm-hmm. step is what we call housekeeping. And that's going to be like, how are the vendor and the customer and the accounts get lists getting used? And how do we clean all of that up when we inherit this set of books so that we're a not inheriting some kind of like crazy structure that that doesn't make sense for us to continue to maintain or b it's like everybody's seen the movie where you're scrolling through the bank feed and there's 400,000 vendors and you just click too quick and it's not the right one right so the the cleaner we can keep those lists over time the better uh and then the final one is what we call the sniff test so it's the AR and AP aging, it's the balance sheet, it's the PL, just looking for like, do we have a collections issue that we're going to need to help advise our client on? Some kind of bill payment issue. Are there any weird patterns in the balance sheet and PL that we need to be aware of to help um, you know, maybe advise them on? Maybe it's not actual bookkeeping errors, but it's mm-hmm. it's things where it's like, hey, I'm seeing that gross margin keeps going up and down. You know, maybe we need to look at at making sure that your accruals are are being done properly so we can track that, that some stuff like that. Yeah. So is that piece automated too, or does it like flag these issues and you have to kind of understand how to talk about it and advise around it? Like what is the scope of the program at that? So a lot of the first stuff is, so the first two sections is going to have what we call, you know, insights. And so it's going to give you the data from that client file. And then it's sort of going to breadcrumb you and say, Hey, here's why you might want to look at this. And you know, here's how this data might be useful so that you get primed or you get that context when you go to look at the actual data with what actually, what patterns am I, am I looking for here? We've not got that built out for things like AR AP aging reports or the p and and balance sheet variants. Some mm-hmm. of that's just more like using your context and your knowledge as a bookkeeper to yeah. assess, like, is there an actual problem here? But it's certainly somewhere where over time we want to continue to inject quote unquote, smarter you know, analysis on those yeah. reports. And is that something that you're, I guess I'm like jumping the gun here and going to make you talk about something that's in the pipeline. <laughs> that is a secret, <laughs> but like, that seems like a good job for AI. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
and what isn't these days, right? Yeah. Everything's <laughs> everything's AIable. No, there's I the thing I really like about um, let's take Chat GPT for example, is that you know, ultimately it's a large language model. And the thing that makes that good is that when you think about even the account structure, right? We we come up with account names, which is language, right? This is a, it's a type of language, whatever language you're using. And so the layering of chat GPT onto something like ingesting financial data, I think is a really good use case. In addition to other kind of pri- proprietary models that we could build over time on top of the actual fundamental or underlying financial data itself. But it's a good use case in providing some of those nuggets that you could then take from the platform and then go tell your client, right? So maybe it's ingesting this data and then it generates these insights based off of what it's seeing and then gives you some bullet points that you could then take and and go wow your client with. So those are the kinds of things that we're thinking about implementing on the analytical kind of advisory quote unquote side of what we're doing. We'll be back after a quick break. This episode of the Ambitious Bookkeeper podcast is sponsored by my brand new free training, The Ultimate Guide to Creating a Profitable Bookkeeping Business. In just one hour, you will learn three keys to creating and launching a profitable bookkeeping business. We will map out your path to creating a bookkeeping or accounting business that keeps you in control of your time, priorities, and expertise. From someone who built a six-figure firm on part-time hours. That's right. You can stay in control of your time, keep family as your priority, and serve your clients well. It just takes a little strategy up front, and I'm going to help you with that during this free training. So head over to the show notes to sign up now for the next training and find out how you can choose the work you do, kick imposter syndrome to the curb, use tech to be super efficient, which all leads to a profitable business. Just head on over to ambitiousbookkeeper.com slash training, and I will see you there. Yeah, I can see that as being super helpful, especially not having to like the thing that scares me is with all this talk with like AI of people like uploading financial statements to chat GPT and having it like just floating around out there whereas if it's within a software like this that's secure it's safer to do that kind of stuff so I would recommend making sure that (laughs) people aren't just like willy-nilly sending information out into the world wide web just to get yep. chat gpt to do your job <laughs> also, yeah i also do not recommend that and there's ways i mean some of the concern with chat gpt too is they say that you pretty explicitly that like oh you know things that you upload are not going to be used to continue to train the model but they also said that it was open AI and then made themselves a private company that's for profit. So it's sort of yeah. like, how much do we believe the marketing promises of what they're saying? And there, there are ways to take those same models and self-host them so that you do have a closed environment where, you know, our client's data or our customer's data, for instance, is staying within our data structures and not then going out and being used to train, you know, chat GPT, the wider chat GPT model going forward. Yeah. So can we can you talk a little bit about the security of systems and what people should be looking for when they're looking at adding on something that's linked to their QuickBooks or Zero file? <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of it's just around without getting too technical. It's like take the things that your favorite apps or like the big apps are doing. So think about the types of security that Bill.com or QuickBooks or these other ones have implemented. It's MFA, it's permissioning, it's different like roles and controls that are kind of baked into the into the app. And then use that as a model to kind of assess some of the other apps that you're using. And it's, you know, it goes really technical behind the scenes to like how deep all of these different security configurations are actually set up in their infrastructure. A lot of that honestly is going to be a black box, even if they say, you know, oh, we do this, we do this, we do this. So you're looking for things like, is their infrastructure built on SOC compliant, SOC compliant standards? And so for us, for instance, we architect everything on AWS. And in AWS, they essentially have a framework that you can use for ensuring that you're using security best practices, 
turning on these scanners that are constantly scanning your, your infrastructure for weaknesses, vulnerabilities, old packages or libraries that you're using, right? And so, you know, in terms of best practices behind the scenes, that's all stuff we're doing. The way that we kind of present that is like, hey, we're going to offload in a lot of ways our security onto AWS, whose entire thousand person or whatever security team is going to fix and find and manage all of this stuff, right? Because we don't want to be in charge as an app of trying to roll all of this stuff ourselves. So yeah, I would say just things like that are, are things you could look for to get more comfort. But honestly, in a not great way, it's still it's just a black box. It's like, <laughs> you know. Yeah, you are security. ultimately sort of putting your trust in like for your in, for instance for you AWS and putting your trust in their security capabilities which you can double check on like you mentioned the SOC report so there's a SOC 1 and SOC 2 when you're in a public company and you have other softwares that you heavily rely on your auditors are going to ask you if you've received those reports from those softwares which basically yeah. means that they are upholding their security standards right in layman's terms <laughs> like i'm trying to yeah. break this down for people because not everyone has that background uh but i do have a blog on this as well <laughs> because yeah. i get asked that question all the time when i'm teaching new bookkeepers or people that are leaving corporate to come start their own business and we're doing everything on the cloud now they're like well how do you ensure that like that's secure and why do you use google workspace and all this kind of stuff so it's like well, this is how, but you can also take your own security measures. Like for instance, I pay for an yet again, another software add-on that backs up our zero files, our client's zero files for us. So if we ever, I mean, you can do this manually too. You can literally export your zero file, but nobody has time for that. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. but yeah, so that's one thing that that you can do to maintain peace of mind. And then if you have business insurance, especially cyber insurance, they're going to give you a checklist of things that you should have implemented within your business. And, and that's a good place to start. hundred percent. Yeah. And I, I'll, I'll note that at, at least from my reading on the subject, the vast majority of cases where somebody is able to access a system that they quote unquote hack into, it is some form of social engineering, meaning they have tricked somebody with access to that system in a way that gives them the credentials that they need to log in. And then they can have, you know, there's other patterns where they can escalate permissions. So even simple things like don't reuse your passwords, have a password manager with, you know, basically the, the full extent of the level of complexity that that system will take as far as a password goes, right? And the more of these things that you layer on, the harder of a company or whatever attack point that you become. And so people just move on, right? They want to go, yeah. hackers want to go to high output for the amount of effort places. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, because of the world we live in, especially as bookkeepers, like we have access to tons of data. So there's there's a lot of potentially, we're, it's a target rich environment in this space. But if you just make yourself like a little bit harder to penetrate than Joe Schmo down the street, they might try and then they're going to go, nah, it's not worth it. Move on, right? So that's yeah. kind of what you want in the best case scenario. Yeah, absolutely. That's just like another reason why I prefer bookkeepers to not like do bill pay and stuff for their clients unless they're using something like bill.com. Like don't have access to your client's actual, you know, real bank login that gives you access to transfer money and do bill pays that way, especially as you start to grow your team. That's one simple, simple security measure that you can take is just not allowing your clients to give you their bank password, like make them set you up with a statement only access of you only access yeah. and yeah. limit your own, like your own risk there. <laughs> yeah. It's so wild too, because it's so client specific, but I've had clients on one end of the spectrum that are like, I don't want you to have access to any of our systems. I'm like, well, I need, we need access, you know? And I've had other clients that before our proposal or, you know, was even signed, they're like texting me, login and password. And I'm like, dude, do not do yeah. this. I don't, <laughs> I was like, I don't want this. I don't want you sending plain text passwords or text messages to me. Also, we don't even have a signed agreement yet. Like, so it's just, yeah. it's just wild, you know, the, the spectrum. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So just a little side note, I do have a older podcast where I dive into this cyber cybersecurity type stuff with um, an insurance broker 
and I'll link that in the show notes. So if you want more resources on that. So what is on the, like, what's on the roadmap? I mean, you kind of alluded to it, but what's on the roadmap for Scrutinize? Where, like, where are you trying to, if you want to share, where are you trying to take this thing? (laughs) Yeah. 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 So the way that we think about Scrutinize is it, it is over time going to become like a more robust platform and we're going to do things outside of just, you know, reviewing the books. And, and those things might be like, how do we improve or like 10 X the experience of setting up bank rules at a firm level and then being able to apply that, you know, where it makes sense across your clients or how do we improve the experience of cleanups by building more robust kind of sort of like bulk action cleanup tools and smart tools like that. But the way that it'll kind of be structured over time is more like a series of modules that you could turn on or off for any given client that you're servicing. So instead of a take it or leave it, it's all or nothing, and the price reflects that over time, the way that we we sort of intend to build it is, hey, we've got you know Assess, which is our quality review module that we built out. And if you need quality reviews, you could turn that on, and this is the price structure for that. Oh, if you need these bulk cleanup tools, you could flip that on. If you want the bank rules engine, you know, kind of stuff that we're building, you could flip that on. And so over time, it'll be kind of like the toolbox that you take to a job. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you don't always need the wrench, but you got a hammer in there. You got a screwdriver in there too. And you can kind of pull out that specific combination that you need for whatever that job is that you're doing in that moment. I like that. That's really neat because I'm just thinking about my business model where, I could see us needing the assess tool a lot, but typically when we get in there, like our types of clients are fairly simple and straightforward. So it's not like, I don't think we would need that bulk cleanup situation. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's more of the assess tool, just figuring out that we've making sure we've priced things correctly, (laughs) right? Before we do that. And then getting a decent look at like what does need to be cleaned up. But yeah, whereas someone who maybe works with a volume heavy type client with inventory and all sorts of things like that might need that bulk cleanup tool. Cause if something is wrong once with the inventory, likely it's a widespread problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ecom gone wrong. Is yeah. <laughs> a, that's a horror movie that we've unfortunately seen. <laughs> yeah. So reporting, I guess, since you're building out like you have kind of the analytical tools. Do you, are you planning on doing something with linking to a reporting software to feed information in or like adding that piece in? Do you, here's another question. <laughs> I'm sure my audience will want to know when you do the assessment, does it spit out a report, like a checklist that you can like have as a deliverable to a client if you're charging for diagnostic reviews or things like that? So on some of the, let's say like three statement reporting, that's definitely where you're going to create a financial package and send that off to your client for the period. That's definitely something that we're more interested in partnering with people that are really great at that and just being able to send, you know, lightly editorialized data maybe over to that system. And so they could package it all up and send it. Now, where I think we do excel and, and will on the reporting front continue to deliver and expand what we do is on our exports. So right now, the way it works is depending on what uh, type of review or workflow you run and the different configurations that you have for that. So you could customize the sections or you could create custom queries against that data, right? Whatever you could figure there is exportable to Excel. And the way that uh, we tend to you know, recommend that you use that is that especially for let, let's say you like scoping a cleanup, you go run it over whatever the cleanup period is, you export all of that. And then a lot of times it's helpful to tell clients or give clients the reason why all of this stuff is messed up. And so you could go to each of the tabs in that export and say, hey, here's what I'm seeing here. This is why we're going to need to clean this up. This is why this is important. And we can't glaze over it. And what you do is you come up with all these different you know tabs that you've kind of lightly editorialized and you send that with your proposal. And what I found, at least when we were you know, sending more proposals at, at the firm, was that, especially for cleanups, people choke. You're like, hey, it's going to be $7,000. And they're like, 
how, what, mm-hmm. you know, and you're like, well, here's an Excel file with all the things we're going to need to clean up. And you kind of lightly in a good way. And the only way I ever recommend is lightly overwhelm them at the front end with an understanding of how messed up their books are, which justifies mm-hmm. the cost. And so definitely making that whole process a lot more streamlined and having the editorializing maybe happen in scrutinize and maybe like a nice PDF version of that, you know, generated in addition to the Excel file is, is stuff we're looking at over time. Awesome. Yeah, that is, because that's something that when I do a diagnostic, I, I basically give them like a summarized checklist of like, these are the accounts that we're going to be working on. These are kind of the stats with them. So for instance, like if your bank hasn't been reconciled for two years, we're like, <laughs> 24 months of bank reconciliation, (laughs) (laughs) you know, like let's make it a little, like make them understand that it's a monthly thing, not an annual thing. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. But it's also a deliverable that where the way we position it is because we charge for a diagnostic. So when you come to us, if you have existing books, the first step is a diagnostic. There's a fee to it, but if you engage us for the cleanup, we will roll that fee into the cleanup price because we've already done a lot of the heavy lifting at that point. I don't tell them that's why, but that's my explanation for bookkeepers when they're like, why would you roll that in? Because like one of the hardest parts is analyzing where all the problems are. But if they don't decide to engage us, they feel like they've walked away with something of value. And that's like literally a PDF of a checklist. And I'll say, if you don't go with us, you at least have a checklist to give to another bookkeeper to have them try to figure it out. But I'm not guaranteeing that they're going to do it the way we would or correctly. (laughs) Yep. Exactly. I love that. And I love that you charge for it. And then, cause that's, that's something I feel like a lot of people are sort of giving away. But as you said, it's like, half the work is getting your hands around what's wrong to begin with. And then it's just sort of like, okay, we need to execute on like clean this, clean this, walk this forward, whatever. Yeah. I like that a lot. I like the crediting idea because it's sort of like. They have nothing to lose. They have nothing to lose. And they're still, they're still kind of at the top end of that funnel. So it's like, you've begun this economic transaction. So they Mm -hmm. already are exchanging money for value. Right. Which is the whole thing. And then it's like, Hey, by the way, if you stay with us, like, it's just a nice sort of foot in the door. And the most like simple part of it is that like, maybe this isn't simple for a lot of people, but maybe this will help a bookkeeper that doesn't charge for diagnostic understand, even if you're just going to charge a hundred dollars for a diagnostic, it creates that financial transaction where they realize this is not for free. Like it sets a precedent that the work you do is valuable. And if they're not willing to pay a measly hundred dollars to have someone diagnose the state of their books, how do you think it's going to go when you try to present them a $7,000 proposal? <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. So yes. it weeds out people and that scares You're other better. people too, right? And I do the same thing with my discovery calls. If someone comes to me cold and tries to book a discovery call, they're charged for it. There's a backdoor situation where I don't charge for discovery calls, but you've already been vetted at that point that and a yeah. qualified lead. So it, that scares a lot of bookkeepers when they're used to getting lots of, lots of leads, but I'm like, well, how many no-shows are you getting on those discovery calls? Oh, I get people not showing up all the time. I'm like, well, do you want to change that? (laughs) Cause that's a waste of your time. (laughs) And same with the diagnostics I've had when I didn't charge for diagnostics or waited to bill them until after I had completed the diagnostic, those people ghosted. Yeah. I never got them as a client. That only took me two tries of realizing this isn't good. It's not going to work to not charge them. And it's not going to work to wait to charge them until I deliver the report. They pay up front. <laughs> it's so like deep, I think ingrained in a lot of people that, that do bookkeeping as well to where, you know, and I'm not like casting aspersions because I think it's easy to do in, in, in any field where you become more competent. Mm-hmm. It's easy with the curse of knowledge to start to devalue or undervalue what your expertise actually is worth to people. Because behind the scenes, you're like, you're like, well, it was easy for me to do. That's what we hear a lot. Well, it's it's easy for me to do. So I just do it, you know, for free. It's like, it's easy for you to do because you've been doing this for 15 years and you know how to do it. Right. Mm-hmm. But it's not in relation to the value that you're providing this person. And how do you sort of think about this relationship in terms of not how easy it is for you or how much time it took you? It's like, how much value are you creating and how do we capture some of that? Right. I like the way you, you frame that. And also calendar abuse is so real. It's like people think nothing of it. You're just like, okay, well, I guess 
Yeah. I guess I'll just go eat lunch. Or... I kind of did that to you, but I did email you. <laughs> no, I'm talking the no call, no show. Not, yeah. not, not like people get busy, things like that. I have no problem with people being like, I need to reschedule or whatever, but literally right. three, maybe a week on average, mm-hmm. just people that are like, because my calendar links are all over the place and people book it because I'm not, you know, in that sort of realm, I'm not charging people for like a demo of scrutinize. Right. Maybe I should. Right. it's a deposit you'll get it back when you show up it's like when you I I used this example the other day and it's same with the discovery call thing like if somebody did book a discovery call and ended up signing on as a client I would probably credit their first invoice but for that amount but the truth of the matter is also a lot of people book discovery calls that really just wants a consultation and they should pay for it anyway And I give a lot of value on those calls and everyone feels better about it. They don't feel bad about asking all the questions they have in that situation. But one of the examples I recently used probably on the podcast was like when you go to a bar and you are trying to play pool and you have to give the bartender your driver's license to get the pool balls. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You're bringing them back. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You could do something similar. Like you pay a $15 deposit and you'll all refund you after the demo. <laughs> yeah. Whoever cracks that. Yeah. If you if somebody out there is listening and wants to crack that problem, I will pay you money to solve that. So. <laughs> yeah. Maybe there is an AI tool that like crawls the internet to find how many times this person has booked other demos and not shown up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You could sort of just like blacklist them. Be like, they're not on the good list. <laughs> Yeah. But anyways, okay. So if someone is interested in having a demo of Scrutinize and is actually going to show up, (laughs) where should they go to do that? And do you have any other special things to share and how to connect with you and all that good stuff? Yeah. So as far as booking demos, starting trials, just general questions, you could go to scrutinize.io and different buttons on that site that you can click to either book a demo or go right to starting you know your free 14-day free trial if you want to connect with me elsewise you send me an email to john at scrutinize.io or i hang out on tax twitter a lot so at john ray 88 so j-o-h-n-r-e-a-8-8 over there dms are open so you know even if it's like just to talk shop or you've got questions or you just want to nerd out on quality control and bookkeeping with me, then I'm always down to do that too. So Awesome. And before we hit record, you said that you have a special discount code for our listeners when they do sign up for Scrutinize. Yep. So you get a 14 day free trial. And then after that, it sort of nudges you to sign up to one of the paid tiers. If you do choose to sign up to one of the paid tiers, when you go through the checkout, if you enter ambitious 25, in the like coupon code section, you'll get 25% off your entire first year subscription. So. Wow. That's a really generous discount. Thank you. And we will link all of that information in the show notes. So you don't have to rewind and re-listen to that. Um, <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much. I have one last question though, since you were a firm owner and you kind of get all this, what piece of advice would you give someone who is just starting to go out on their own and, you know, something that you wish you'd have known when you started that would have maybe fast-tracked you? That even after, (laughs) you know, years and years and years and years and years, all of those questions that you have internally that are like eating you up around, you know, am I going to be found out as like incompetent? Is this price too high? Like, it, that will always kind of stay with you. And the best that you could do is just challenge that and make that voice quieter over time. And and maybe that's not like a positive message that that happy voice stays with you. But the way I see it is that it's just sort of like, I felt like when I started, everything was new. I was super insecure about my pricing, my process, you know, how I would handle all of these different processes, parts of, of running the firm. And I continuously changed all of it, right? I'm like yeah. you're continuously growing, you're continuously changing. So just start somewhere, even hanging your shingle on the door and putting yourself out there is really the hardest step that you could take. And mm-hmm. after that, you know, you'll get a little momentum and everything will start to feel a lot easier to kind of tweak as you go. Yeah, I love that. And you're not going to be able to improve unless you start. So I love that. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much again for your time and we'll talk to you soon. Yeah, that sounds great. Thanks, Rena.
Thank you to everyone who helps make this podcast possible. Content and interviews are produced by me, Serena Shu. Our intro and outro music is written and performed by my brother, Ian Gilliam. Editing is also by Ian using his awesome sound engineering skills along with Descript software. Hosting and publishing is by Buzzsprout. And you can check out the show notes for links to all of these amazing resources and resources mentioned in the episode. Be ambitious.